Thank you very much, Dr. Monica De Silva, for the kind opportunity to talk to you. I'm a consultant rheumatologist, as mentioned in the uh, West Midlands and north of Birmingham at the Kanak and Wolverhampton Rheumatology Center, and I have a special interest in osteoporosis. I'm going to talk to you about the size of the problem in Asia, and particularly in Sri Lanka, and touch upon fracture risk assessment. And what are the new things that are coming in fracture risk assessment? And especially when you don't have easy access to bone density scans, how you can do clinically, and to highlight the importance of vertebral fractures, which are common in Asia as well, and complete with the treatment options available and the side effects. All of you are familiar with this slide. This is a normal bone under the microscope, and this is the osteoporotic bone, like holes in the bone. And this has got less trabecular connectivity and easily somebody can break a bone with minimal trauma. And we want to prevent these fractures. So this is the slide showing the difference between men and women and at different ages, the incidence of fractures. Though it's almost 15 years old, it's still valid. Women have more fractures than men. And in the early postmenopausal years, when the reflexes are good, risk fractures are more common. But later in life, when they fall on the hip and the reflexes are not good, hip fractures tend. And this is a picture about radiological vertebral fractures, which are picked up in studies. And only one in 10 of these patients come for clinical attention, vertebral fractures. And there is a second peak of risk fractures later in life. What is the burden in Asia? We are expecting an increased risk of osteoporotic fractures, especially hip fractures, by 2050. You all heard about the net zero of climate change by 2050, and this is going to be a huge time bomb. This is because of the aging population, which is increasing in Asia, and urbanization, people moving from rural areas, and decreased physical activity, and changes to the nutrition. This is a slide again, the projection from 30 years ago, which is coming true now. So increased risk of hip fractures in 2015 in Asia. In the last 30 years, the hip fractures have gone by two to three times more. And in the next 30 years, they are likely to increase another three times. And we all need to be prepared as physicians to address this risk and how we can minimize this. So this is the regional audit of Asia Pacific region from the International Osteoporosis Foundation. Those almost eight years old, it's still valid, though there might be some changes. Now I'll just highlight the figures for Sri Lanka. In 2013, the life expectancy was 76 years and the projected one to go to 82 years. And people about the age of 50 are going to go to 38%. So as people are living longer and multiple morbidities and increased risk of hip fractures. So this is a study by Dr. Lekhamasam and colleagues published last year in Archives of Osteoporosis, looking at fracture risk, hip fractures in Sri Lanka. When you standardize for 100,000 person years, it is not as high as in North America or Scandinavia or Northern Europe. But you're currently seeing about 4,000 hip fractures a year and about 10 per day. And in 2051, it's going to increase to 12,000, 3.3 times increase per day. And I think for a country for the size of Sri Lanka, when the population is going to be 24 million, this is a significant increase. And I think clinical risk factor prediction, all of you should be familiar with FRACS, which is from the WHO Center for Osteoporosis in Sheffield, developed by John Canners, Eugene McCloskey and colleagues. And this is open access and you can easily access that. And they've got country-specific fracture prediction. And if you just look at the prediction for Sri Lanka, so you go into the calculation tool, look at the clinical risk factors, which all of you have got access to, age, sex, weight, height, 
previous fracture, if the parent has fractured a hip before the age of 75, if they are current smokers, are they on steroids, if they have rheumatoid arthritis. These are nine clinical factors which all of you got access to when you're seeing the patient. And if you probe a bit in the history, you get secondary osteoporosis. Have they got type 1 diabetes mellitus? Have they gone through the change very early? Have they got osteogenesis imperfecta, any other malabsorption problem? Are they drinking more alcohol? Then if you've got access to bone density, you can incorporate that. But without bone density, if you just apply the Sri Lankan one, so we can get a risk, a major osteoporotic risk in the next 10 years of 8% for this lady who is 65 years old and weighs 70 kg and the height is 165 and she's got rheumatoid arthritis, which you'll see in your clinics. What is the risk of hip fracture in the next 10 years? 2.3. Unfortunately, it's been available for 10 years, but less than 20,000 people have accessed, 20,000 patients have been accessed with this. And we all need to use this more to try and decide on treatment. When do we decide about intervention? If you're in America, they've got a fixed intervention threshold. If the major osteoporotic fracture is 20% and hip fracture is 3%, they think it's intervention. In UK, we've got the National Osteoporosis Guideline Group, which has got age-specific intervention. But Dr. Lekham Vasam and colleagues have worked out the intervention thresholds in Sri Lanka. At 50, major osteoporotic fracture risk of 2.7 and hip fracture of 0.4. And at 80, it is 18 and 7.1. Maybe difficult to try and remember all this, but we can simplify that with a hybrid method. If you're less than 70, 6% major osteoporotic fracture in the next 10 years or 2% hip fracture. 15 and 5 at 70. 18 and 7 at about 80. So this is easily implementable. And if somebody has got such a high fracture risk, you need to consider treatment. And you can decide clearly the people in the red need treatment, people in the green just need lifestyle intervention and optimizing calcium and vitamin D. And the people in the middle might use the limited bone density scans available to decide on treatment. Moving on. FRAX is going to modify some of the things with the new evidence available from studies from Iceland. So we've got what's called a very high risk threshold. People who have had a recent fracture, people who have had multiple fractures, very low bone density, and people who are fracturing on treatment. And how does this change the paradigm of treatment? If you've got a low risk, we see that we can optimize treatment, lifestyle, hormone replacement. High risk is the current option of anti resorptives And very high risk patients we are moving on to using anabolic agents early, like teriparatide. And we also have romazosumab, which I'll talk about later, and then use anti resorptives later, and even consider local treatment, local bone enhancing treatment. What is imminent fracture risk? There is a highest risk of future fracture in the first two years after a sentinel fracture. It's higher in the young age groups, high after a vertebral fracture compared to a risk fracture. And the FRAX is going to come up with a modification factor to reflect a correction of twofold or threefold in the major osteoporotic fracture. As you can see from this Icelandic study, most people fracture in the first six months to 12 months to 24 months, and the fracture incidence becomes less remotely after the index fracture. And this also changes with age. The younger people in the first six to 24 months have a higher risk of fracture compared to later in life. And if you look at five years, the fracture risk goes down. And we had to deal with our long waiting list during the pandemic and infection control. We couldn't do DEXA scans for everybody. So we had to prioritize patients who will really benefit from DEXA scan. And we published this in Osteoporosis International. So people at higher risk, we can intervene without a DEXA scan. People at a low risk, may not need a scan, and people in the intermediate risk, you can use the limited resources. Fracture license services are really making a difference. If you catch patients after the first risk fracture and intervene, then you could prevent the hip fractures. And evidence from Glasgow, the fracture license service capital in UK, and it's been sort of reproduced in other areas. So International Osteoporosis Foundation have invested a lot in this capture the fracture initiative. 
And I was just looking at it in June 2021, there is one center in Galle in Sri Lanka, which has got a fracture liaison service. And we need to have more of these to try and prevent more fractures. Vertebral fractures have been a syndrome in osteoporosis, but they are the most common osteoporotic fracture and 70% remain undiagnosed. If you take 55% of older women with a hip fracture, they've already had a prior vertebral fracture. It is an opportunity to try and intervene. But I think there is no definite radiological reporting and only fewer are acted upon even if they are reported. There is ambiguity in the reports. They say deformity or crush fracture, or they don't call it a fracture all the time. But why are vertebral fractures important? They increase the risk of subsequent fracture, fivefold, and twofold risk of hip fracture. And one in five women who have a vertebral fracture will have another fracture within a year. And if they have more vertebral fractures at baseline, the risk is exponential. What is the health impact? We know that they are strong predictors of future fractures. If left untreated, they can cause a lot of morbidity and they include additional visits, 14 additional visits to the primary care physician locally after the year of fracture. And identification provides an opportunity to intervene. What happens to the patient? If you could see this lady, slowly with multiple vertebral fractures, it's a cascade effect, losing height, bulging of the abdomen. And you can clinically see as a decrease in the space between your the rib margin, the costal margin, and the iliac crest. Acute and chronic pain, less body image, breathing difficulties, depression, reflex and GI symptoms, difficulty in managing activities of daily living, and the need to use a walking aid, losing independence, and it also increases mortality. This is a semi-quantitative classification by Janant Nalas from America. So this is the commonest one, anterior wedging, decrease in height of the body by 25%, up to 40% is moderate, more than 40% is thin. It could be biconcave or it could be a crush fracture involving the posterior elements. We were involved in the Royal College of Radiology audit of CT chest, abdomen and pelvis cross-sectional, done in many hospitals by physicians over a three week period in more than 70 year old patients. The images are reformatted and incidental fractures had to be reported. And the vertebral fractures were graded by Janan's method. We excluded severe trauma and cancer. Electronic records were reviewed to look at the underlying problems. Out of the 105 scans, 14 were excluded. In the remaining 91, one in five had an osteoporotic vertebral fracture, but none of the reports included a recommendation for further intervention. We worked on this under reporting of vertebral fractures, worked with our radiologists and to change the reporting, and they link it now to the fracture license service. And over the last year, we've had 100 new reference for vertebral fractures in our local unit. This is a powerful predictor of future fractures and increasing awareness, and which could be done by physicians like you in your country. This underdiagnosed vertebral fractures is a worldwide problem. Global rate is about 34%. And I think we can all work on to improve the identification of vertebral fractures. Steroids, commonly used by physicians for many indications, they also increase the risk of vertebral fractures 1.5 times, even at a lower dose from the study, which is more than 20 years old from the general practice research database. But fortunately, if you intervene after coming off steroids, the fracture risk goes down and we could stop the treatment. This is the American College of Clinical Endocrinology Guidelines for postmenopausal osteoporosis. And this is to just highlight this very high risk I highlighted earlier, recurrent recent fractures, fractures in approved therapy, multiple fractures, very low T-score, fall a history of injurious falls, and very high FRAX score for the Western population. We think about anabolics here. And these are high-risk patients who are, do not have the criteria for the very high risk. Moving on to treatment, bisphosphonates are the mainstay of therapy because they generate, they're easily available. Oral bisphosphonates are preferred but they can work around for a longer time. And intravenous zolodonate, I understand, is available in Sri Lanka. And that may be also a good option for people who can't comply with treatment, but we need to careful with patients with renal impairment. The challenge of oral bisphosphonate is compliance. Because of the complex dosing, 
fear of side effects. And it's like any other chronic condition, people may not continue the treatment. It's only 50% or less continue it after one year. And if they're not going to take it, it's lack of efficacy and reduces the cost effectiveness. And there's a study which shows that people who complied, the fracture risk decreased, and people who didn't comply, it carried on. Denosumab is an option. In our unit, we find we have a low threshold for switching patients to intravenous zolidronate or denosumab because of the high compliance. This may not be widely available in Sri Lanka. It's useful too, as an option in patients who can't have intravenous zolidronate. If they have renal insufficiency or ADFR below 30 or 35, we can use it up to 15, but the risk of hypercalcemia is high. And one caution is if you delay the injection for more than four weeks, there's increased risk of bone loss and reborn fractures in one in 10 patients. This risk is higher if denosumab is being used for more than two years. For these patients, there are randomized controlled trials being done of using oral bisphosphonates and or zolidronate, maybe six monthly, guided by bone turnover markers. Teripartite is an anabolic agent. Again, I understand it's not widely available, but may come available with the availability of biosimilars now. Daily injection for up to 24 months. We currently use it as third line in UK, but it might change with the evidence coming on very high risk patients. There's a new kid on the block, romazozumab, an anti-sclerostin antibody. We were involved in the clinical trials for this medicine. It's a monthly injection for 12 months, but a caution in people with cardiovascular risk, MI or stroke, but it increases bone density even more than teriparatide. What about the complications? Bisphosphonates have adverse events like osteonecrosis of the jaw between one in 10,000 to one in 20,000 patients and atypical femoral fractures. We will see that in the next few slides. But the risk of a typical osteoporotic fracture is around one in 100, but this risk is less common. But because of the fear of the side effects, people don't take the treatment and still have hip and vertebral fractures. But if you take the treatment effectively, then they can reduce the fracture. Osteonecrosis of the jaw, fossy jaw. This caused cast stories in newspapers and the treatment compliance in America with this treatment has gone down in the last 10 years because of these cast stories. But this is more common in advanced cancer where they use intravenous zolidronate, the most monthly or quarterly. It's one in 10,000 to one in 100,000. And if they have poor dental hygiene or they're having major dental procedures, somebody on steroids or vitamin D insufficiency. But we need to counsel the patients and check them regularly. What is this risk in a context? This is a risk in sort of 100,000 people per year. The risk of a fracture is 2,600. Hip fracture, nearly 400. The risk of osteonecrosis of the jaw is just slightly higher than death by lightning strike there. So we need to put that in perspective to our patients. It is even rarer than anaphylaxis many times. Just to finish with a case, this is an 84 year old lady we recently saw in the last year. She's been on steroids for a long time for allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis from a chest physician. She had multiple comorbidities and she was given alendronate rightly for bone protection as she was on steroids. But she took it for more than 15 years, a rare patient complying. But she presented to her emergency with the right hip pain and lo and behold, she had an atypical femoral fracture. This was treated with intramedullary nailing, but on subsequent x-rays, she found she had an incomplete fracture on the left side, which was managed conservatively. This is the atypical fracture. It's seen in one of the thousand women who have bisphosphonates for more than three years. The classical podrome is insidious thigh pain. So any patient you put on a bisphosphonate, you need to ask them, educate them about this rare side effect and review them. This is seen in patients in advanced cancer treatment as well, usually occur after little or no trauma and they are below the trochanter. We don't understand the mechanism fully, but it's related to low bone turnover. The American Society of Bone and Mineral Research have got effective criteria. As I said, it's located in the shaft and to have four of the five following major fractures without trauma. And I'll show that in the next X-ray. Short oblique configuration, it's not commutative. It has got a medial spiking. There is diffuse cortical thickening. And you can see the lateral beaking. 
So at least having four of the five features. But there's a rapid decline after you stop them. So say after you stop the bisphosphonates. As you can see the study from Denmark, which looked at 10,000 person years. And the longer you take it, more than seven years, the risk of atypical fractures goes up. After you stop it, the risk dramatically falls down. But it's important to know that there are people who don't have any bisphosphonates can also have atypical femoral fractures. And we need to think about low alkaline phosphatase in these patients. This is a study which has shown that the Asian patients in America, this is the clinical, risk fra clinical fractures prevented, hip fractures prevented, and the number of atypical fractures. This is in white Caucasians, and this is in Hispanics. There's increased risk of atypical femoral fractures, and the risk benefit ratio is less in Asians, which we need to take note of. Younger age, Asian ethnicity, higher BMI, steroids, rheumatoid arthritis, other drugs like SSRIs or PPIs, and the femoral geometry can contribute. So 50% of patients were Asians with atypical femoral fractures. There's an almost sevenfold increased risk of this acid. This has been reproduced in studies in Singapore and Sweden, and people are working on this. And this particular study published in Bone last year from Nguyen shows Southeast Asians are slightly higher. So we need to take this into account. And Southern Asians are also higher risk. So how do we manage these ones? Withholding bisphosphonates will reduce the risk after a few months. And atypical fractures may be less common with denosumab as it doesn't hang around in the bone. People have used teriparatide anecdotally, but a randomized control trial has not shown it to improve atypical fractures. And incomplete atypical fractures did not progress to complete on stopping the bisphosphonate. And we can't prevent the fracture on the other side with teriparatide. This is an important slide to try and sort of see what do we do with patients on long-term bisphosphonate. This is the guidance in UK and America. If they want three years of zoledronic acid or five years of oral bisphosphonate, you stop and review. Repeat the bone density scan, reassess the fracture risk, and people have vertebral fractures, hip fractures, repeated fractures, continue the treatment after checking adherence. Or if their BMD is below minus 2.5, this is from the FLEX extension study. They are at a higher risk of future fracture. You continue the treatment. Use the opportunity to switch somebody from an oral bisphosphonate to IV bisphosphonate here. But if they are being good, if they have had no fractures, BMD is improved, T score is above minus 2.5, give them a break. Just continue calcium and vitamin D and reassess fracture risk. But in the Asians, we might have to educate our patients and possibly do it after two years of zoledronic acid or even three years of bisphosphonates because of the higher risk of atypical fractures. What is the future? We expect there should be wider availability of fracture license services with the Capture the Fracture program of the International Osteoporosis Foundation. There are new techniques for diagnosis are coming up. Sarcopenia, I've not touched upon this, but false prevention and muscle strength building. Drugs for aging are going to bring up new sort of therapies for osteoporosis. To conclude, hope I've convinced there is a significant increased risk in osteoporotic fractures in the next 30 years. Timely intervention is essential for imminent fracture risk and very high fracture risk. And we need to optimally use the available therapies what we have and periodic review of patients and long-term bisphosphonate. Thank you very much for the opportunity.